today. Just what options are on the table for Ukraine's future? A model could exist in the history books of another one of Russia's neighbours. Here's the big idea. Finlandization, and here is how it works. After World War II, the Soviet Union occupied most of Eastern Europe and installed puppet regimes loyal to the Kremlin. But unoccupied Finland got to remain neutral, a sort of independent buffer state. In return, Helsinki let the Soviets dictate its foreign policy and some of its domestic policy. Basically limiting their sovereignty and space of manoeuvre to a very large extent. They did not criticise the Soviet Union uh, officially in any way, kept very close ties economically, socially. The Finns were able to cut a deal because they'd surprised the Soviets with their fierce resistance during the Winter War of 1939-40, to which kicked off after a Russian false flag operation. And if you're seeing parallels with modern Ukraine, well, so does Putin. Russia wants Ukraine to be a country in between not in the Western orbit, and the Western orbit includes both NATO and the European Union. In other words, the same demands Russia's been making since it annexed Crimea in 2014. Many analysts say that if you give that to Putin, he will ask for more in the region because eight years of war uh, and 14,000 deaths in Ukraine, it's actually made Ukraine more pro-Western. So this idea might have reached its sell-by date. We don't want to get finished. It's become a dirty word in its country of origin and is basically an insult to Ukraine. But as the war enters a dark new phase and both sides dig in, could Finlandization offer a life-saving compromise? Well, we're joined now by the former Prime Minister for Finland, Alexander Staub. Alexander, the phrase Finlandization is being thrown around a little bit, but what does that actually mean to you, that word? Well, it's actually an offence. Uh, basically, it's a concept that was invented by a German professor in the 1960s and was very much about appeasement toward a grand ag aggressor, in other words, the Soviet Union. The 1970s was a time when we basically had to sacrifice our values, our democracy, and in many ways our freedom. And it was a moment when Russia was meddling in internal affairs in Finland. So Finlandization, A, is an offence, and B, is a solution to absolutely nothing. And I hope we can bury it into the annals of history, please. <laughs> what, what did that system actually look like day to day for the citizens? Well, I wouldn't know because I'm so young, of course, but uh, <laughs> basically you were very careful in what you could say or could not say. So, for example, I don't think there was a real um, freedom of media. Right now we're number one in the world in media freedom, but at the time we couldn't really even publish a basic historic book like Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. So, you know, it wasn't a good way of life. It was basically uh, impeding, limiting your sovereignty and freedom. So that's why we don't like that period at all. OK, we survived the Cold War as a democracy, but nevertheless, it wasn't nice. Totally understand that you wouldn't have liked it. And you said, though, that it's a solution to nothing, which makes me think that you think it was worse than the alternative. What do you think would have happened had Finland not gone down that path? I think that's pure speculation. And to be very honest, I think this is a debate that's very easy to have somewhere in Australia. But when you have 1,340 kilometres of border with a country like Russia, then the Soviet Union, and you know they have nuclear arms, you know they have a big military, there are some things that you have to compromise. Alexander, Russia has also threatened Finland and Sweden with consequences if they join NATO. What's your response uh, to those threats? Nothing new, really. But of course, what we always stress is that it is our independent and sovereign decision to decide which club we join or do not join. And I do immediately add that Finland, of course, is a full member of the European Union and has euro as its currency. On top of that, it has a deep partnership with NATO and is completely NATO compatible when it comes to uh, military. We are actually more NATO compatible than most NATO member states. So, for instance, we have over 60 F-18 fire jets uh, and we just ordered another uh, 64 F-35s. So in that sense, you know, the only thing that we do not have from NATO is Article 5 and a security guarantee. Do you think Russia's aggression will push the Finnish population closer to joining? Oh, definitely. We're already seeing that move. And uh, as a matter of fact, we just had a historic opinion poll for the first time in Finnish history, 53% of the population in favour of NATO membership. 
under 20 against and 19 undecided. So I think the next opinion poll that we'll see will probably pushing north of 60%. But the key is you have to understand that this is a serious security political situation for Finland as well. We don't have an imminent and direct threat, but we should, I think, admit to ourselves that the reason we have a strong military is Russia. And then if security situation in Europe has fundamentally changed, which it has, then Finland has to take a decision in the long run. Do we want to face this aggression alone or do we want to do it as a part of a bigger thing? Because, of course, we can see that NATO is not giving security guarantees to a country that is not a member. We're obviously watching this from afar. You've been in the room with Putin. What's he like? He is uh, extremely well prepared, very rational, uh, very analytical, knows his uh, dossier, uh, if you will, is able to participate in a conversation. So a very, very strong leader. There's, there's no question about that. What do you think he'll do next? I don't know. And, you know, there's a lot of sort of psychotherapy going on about, you know, madman theories and, you know, what's Putin like? Has he lost it? You know, no one really knows. My analysis is, is very simple. Putin bases his thinking on uh, historic Russia or great Russia. He's looking at his legacy, right? So he wants to see his place in history with the likes of Ivan the Terrible or Stalin or, or whoever you might think. So if that is the mindset, my guess is the following. He wants and has a big war. He wants a big peace. And that can lead to two possible strands or avenues. One is the total annexation and, may I add, unfortunately, uh, destruction of Ukraine. The other option is that, and I, I like neither one of these options, let me add. You know, there's some kind of a creation of an East and West Ukraine. Uh, and that is the new sort of iron curtain, if you will, in Europe. You know, looking at it from here, the sort of the borders, you, you have to understand that Putin has done a colossal, colossal mistake. Number one, he wanted to Russify Ukraine. He's Europeanizing Ukraine. Number two, he wanted to split the West. He is unifying the West with a force that we have not seen since the Cold War. Number three, he wanted to split and destroy NATO. NATO has a new sense of purpose. Number four, he wanted to split the European Union. I have never, ever seen the European Union more unified than it is right now. And to add insult to injury, he might actually be causing the eventual membership of Finland and Sweden in NATO. Unfortunately, we are out of time, which is such a shame because it is fascinating and it's been so incredible getting your thoughts tonight, Alexander. We, yeah, really appreciate your time. You know, in Finland, uh, Wednesday <laughs> translates to Wednesday, oh, which means oh. it's time for... My old Wednesday. <laughs> Let's see what's going viral this Wednesday, the beckoned of Varch, Venti Venti. Is that finished as well? It's finished it? as well. Yeah. Uh, absolutely every single word of it. <laughs> uh, first up, this cat, or kata, in, uh, <laughs> has found an annoying way to wake up its owners. Under the... Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Why can't cats use their powers for good? That's so That's smart. So cool. Very smart. And now a quick peep PSA, uh, a peep PSA, if you will. <laughs> when you're stopping for a wheel, uh, we're shopping for a wheelbarrow. Don't do this. There we go. Just having a look around. Okay, we're in Bunnings here. Okay, might look at the, the one at the top. Okay, let's get you standing. This, like, this might be the one, actually. Um, uh, yeah, you got, you got, you got, you I can see the wheelbarrow challenge really taking off during my week uh, at universities around the country. Last week, we had a thirsty, thirsty hamster who has since been banned from uh, the show. Uh, this week, it's a thirsty squirrel. <laughs> I oh, know, it's gobbling it down. In fairness, they were doing free ref refills. That's, that's, that's <laughs> understand. And finally, let's bring it home with a show stopping musical number from a dad just trying to impress his little girl. <laughs> frozen. Wow. Quite the show. Let's have a look at the reaction from the little girl. She had surely. <laughs> <laughs> 
sweetie. <laughs> So cute. He also does a wonderful version of the Lion King using Lynx Africa. It is amazing. <laughs> you really need to see it. And that was... My old man's day. <laughs> Time for a break.